Today's topic is very serious. Paradigm shift in legal education, a new way of teaching law. We are very, hello everyone. Good to be with you once again. We are very lucky to have with us Anand Padmanabhan, a lawyer, an educator, and a technology policy enthusiast, and someone who is in a position to do something about the law because he's the dean. So over to you, Anand. Thank you, Subodh. Uh, I think I'd begin with saying that something with which I saw very recently while a mid-career student at the Stanford University Graduate School of Business kind of alarmed me initially and then excited me. This was a new AI-powered uh, software, Harvey.ai, which, when posed questions on Indian law, started rattling out answers like ChatGPT does, exactly the same way, but on legal queries. So I started off with something as basic as Keshwanand Bharati versus Union of India, which is a defining case on the basic structure doctrine in India. Okay, hang, on for, to India. Hey, hang on for a second. Yes. That is a yes. case decided quite some time back, 1968, I think, or something 70. like that, by the 73. Indian Supreme Court. Yes. And yes. it said that there are certain parts of the constitution which cannot be amended. The basic structure means uh, parliament has no right to amend everything in the constitution. There are some parts that it can't amend. It's very important legal yes, position right. because it preserves the original thinking and not subject to the whims of each uh, general election. So let's yes, let's right. hear about this case. Yes. So. This is one of the most cited cases of the Indian Supreme Court, the highest bench strength ever, 13 judges. So really significant. So I began assuming that most likely the AI will give me a very rudimentary write-up on that. And then it turned out that the write-up that I got, the report, was fairly sophisticated, fairly detailed, went into what each judge said. So then I tried to push the boundaries further. I asked more complicated queries on law, and every time the response was quite sophisticated. Finally, I ended up asking a very policy open-ended type question. Why is marital rape not criminally prohibited in India? This was the query that I posed. And what I saw unfold in front of my eyes is software which is not only giving me factual and descriptive detail, but policy arguments for why this is the legal position in India, breaking it down into different categories of policy thinking, like cultural aspects, socioeconomic aspects, and so on and so forth. And that's the moment when I felt alarmed, because these are the kinds of queries I used to address as a young intern and subsequently, as a young lawyer in the chambers of my senior uh, back in Chennai, when I began my career in 2008 as a practicing lawyer. And this, these are the kinds of questions that even today, young lawyers are called upon to address in the beginning stages of their career. So if Harvey.ai could really do this work, why would you need lawyers? Why would you need to hire young lawyers? That was the first, you know, question that I asked. The second, of course, being an educator uh, was, what am I going to teach my students, right? What ways in which we can, you know, equip them to, uh, you know, of course, combat these new challenges, but also perhaps even leverage on these advantages offered by AI, both. So this has really been a very defining moment in my life. Uh, and I must thank my time at Stanford for this. Uh, and that's why Stanford is Stanford, I, I would say, plugging in my alma mater here. Uh, and and can, I I think... give, can I give you a similar personal experience? Okay. Absolutely. Not related to Chad GPT, but his more historical. I uh -huh. used to teach economics in the US in a B level university called the American University, of Washington, DC, from 1981 to 88. Okay. At that time, the only source of knowledge was the professor. 
because yeah. students don't know where to go, what book to read, what journal to look at, even if you know the journal, which article, there's nobody. So the students rely solely on the professor. Okay. Right. And you are the source of knowledge and that's it. Okay. You have to give the knowledge and explain it. Right. Mm. Then yeah. I didn't teach for almost 17 years. I was, and then I went back to teach in 2005. Mm -hmm. And now it was a changed scenario because the knowledge is there on the internet. <laughs> There's nothing that you are going to say. Your only choice is to say this is the topic. Yeah. Then on the topic, they can look up. And if you forget something, you can ask the student in the class. They brought their laptop. Yes. At the time, the smartphones weren't there. They brought their laptop and say, hey, Look up the date for this. <laughs> I don't remember. Right. They can look it up. Yes. So the job became interpretation. Rather, of course, sometimes they're too lazy to just search for the internet. But you know, at that time, internet was also a little bit not so sophisticated. But mm. I taught for several years, and increasingly, the internet was more sophisticated. So the yeah. knowledge was already there. The analysis wasn't there. <laughs> the knowledge was there. Uh, you could still yeah. give an example. You could still say in a course, especially in a master's course, that please write an essay on this issue. And they would have to collect mm. the data. Now what you're saying, that is meaningless because you yeah. you get it anyway. So why should yeah. we train them to do it? So I had to shift from training the students with knowledge to train them with analysis of the existing knowledge absolutely right? now what absolutely. you're saying is even the analysis of the existing knowledge is known <laughs> so <laughs> how does the pro so i've always been wondering for the last nine months how do professors cope with it so please tell me how you plan to cope i'm not teaching anymore and i don't want to go back to teaching but i you know people are writing all over this chat gpt gave me this poem and this I said, don't be stupid. This chat GPT is changing the legal world. I'm involved in economic legal matters in the US on a professional paid basis. And all these things like, okay, uh, you know, what has been done, what has not been done. Uh, you don't have to search. The chat GPT gives you the, or any AI gives you the answer in one minute. Yeah. And better than any research young person could do. Yeah. Right, more comprehensive, and I use it for my. I'm writing a book, and I say, okay, this is my topic. Let me first get all the facts <laughs> from the software, yeah. right? And then, yeah, because I may not even remember everything. Why the, should I go through this business of uh, remembering and searching? Let me just get it. So uh, the, I understand the issue that you are facing completely. So let's proceed. How it works in law. You know, Subodh, I mean, I must thank you for having characterized these phases so beautifully here. Yes, there was the knowledge phase and the information phase. And now the analysis phase too is sort of at least partially being taken over, right? So how do you now proceed from here to create legal education models that build relevance to everything that people can do? Uh, and And to me, the first approach is to think about what is it that AI still cannot replace? Because I, I think that, that that's the most straightforward one, right? Yeah. We can, of course, split hair on other aspects like analysis, how much of it is AI really good at and so on. But the one part which it certainly is not in a position to replace uh, the human mind, uh, at least in the near future, is the communication element, is the connect that a lawyer has with a client is the trust that you build with a client on account of that connect. Uh, so in law schools, typically what we see is a high degree of focus on argumentative education, right? Yes. I mean, you are, you are, you are learned to be that alpha yeah. in the room. Yes. Right. And yes. that is bound to change. That is right. bound to change because uh, you have to, if you want to really do well as a lawyer in the new kind of world that we are entering, be more collaborative, be more empathetic and be somebody who has that ability to form that human connection. 
Yeah. Because that is what is going to be valued not only in the world of law, mm. across various different professions. Yeah. The rest of it is stuff that you will use these tools to build on, but this is the part that the tools cannot replace you. True. So that's the first, you know, element that uh, now that I've taken on this responsibility at Vinaya Commission's law school back in Chennai, we are really training our students to do. But I think all legal education models have to start building in that element of what you uh, often call soft skills training, but what I feel is much more than all these skills and so on. An idea of empathy, an idea of connecting with another individual mm -hmm. and certain skills and techniques yeah. by which you can do that better. Yeah. Uh, and and so with that, you know what what we are now trying to do is to create a communication lab for instance. And, and I have a lot of students uh, actually who uh, don't even converse in English for instance very well. Yeah. Yeah. Right, we we have a mixed bunch of students. There are students who come from backgrounds where they have been conversing in the vernacular uh, language of that particular state, the regional language of that particular state, and then come in and find it very difficult to cope with language. Yeah. And language becomes very important as a connecting factor here. So you need to kind of give them a lot of training on how to communicate in various kinds of settings, not just the legal setting. I mean, our moot court competitions, for instance, place a heavy focus on this is the case, these are the facts, these are the arguments, and then you get into that contestation mode, which is important. But there are all other kinds of settings too where lawyers can play an important role. Uh, to give a very good example in the Indian context, and I think that may be true in the American uh, setting too, mediation, online yes. dispute resolution mechanism. Yes, right? yes which, absolutely. Which, you know, uh, yeah. take matters away from courts but yeah. require a more ameliorative uh, more uh, you know collaborative approach to finding a solution yeah. uh, so we we need to really move a lot of our legal education paradigm to thinking about negotiation strategies better mediators better people you know who can really try and get together to resolve the conflict rather than uh, you know gain mileage out of it uh, yeah. So I think that that requires a very different way of looking at the law. Uh, till now, this was the, one of those things good to have, right? Okay, fine. You know, if you're doing this, that's also good to have. Yeah. But I think going forward, this is absolutely critical to have simply because a lot of the analysis part is going to be taken over by the machine, right? Yes. And you 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 will you will not really uh, you know succeed if that is your plan A. Right. Yeah. So, okay. so that that's the first, you know, uh, uh, point that I would I'd like to make, and and I I really like to know your thoughts on well, on, on this as an educator. Let me and, and let me proceed. ask you first. Let me ask you a question. I'll have something to say yeah. later on, but this is sure. your sure. talk, not mine. Sure. When you talk mediation, do you also talk settlement? I mean, yes. Should, I so you know, I don't know how common it is for uh, civil cases should be settled right rather than go to court. I mean. Mostly, they you don't know what the judge will do, <laughs> so better settle, right? So, but what yeah. what do you want to teach people how to settle? Not just mediate is a, uh, independent, you know. You are a third party in the case, but settle is you are the first or the second party. So, what are the settlement techniques? Uh, you know that famous book from Harvard, How to Get to Yes, right? Uh, settlement. So that's one point which I think may become, especially if the number of cases increases so much as it has, and there's such a backlog in the Indian court system which will never go away. I think uh, both mediation and settlement, I think, should be emerging. What do you say to that? Absolutely. So I think partly thanks to technology, there is a there is an increasing. A process of demystification of legal knowledge yeah. and demystification of knowledge generally. Uh, yes. Many disciplines uh, face that. Yeah. Uh, and and that is both good and bad. I mean, it is bad to the extent that for those who have kept it mystified for so many years, uh, they need to find out other ways of you know <laughs> yeah. make, earning their bread. Yeah. Uh, but it is very good from the point of view of uh, clients who now approach service providers, lawyers in this particular context with a good background understanding of 
what the legal position is. So harping on this is what the Supreme Court said or this is what the statute says is not going to take you too far. No. What you need to do instead, and this is where the training element comes in, is to is to train law students to learn how to create a basket of different options for their client. Uh, often the the world of laws and rules operate in binaries. Yes. This is what the rule says, and this is you know uh, yeah. either either this is how you interpret it or the other way. But instead, how do you create a basket of options where the rule can dictate one course of option, but there can be multiple other options which are built on trust, which are built on what is a speedier resolution, uh, which are which are also built on you know uh, uh, what is it that is more efficient, right? So all these factors come into play and when you uh, teach uh, students i think uh, you know you have to go beyond the rule book to to enable this and you have to not only go beyond the rule book in terms of the substantive knowledge but also in terms of how you train them the kinds of techniques that you use like how do you use something as simple as eye contact to build trust i mean and and suppose you'll probably be surprised with hear this but a lot of indian legal education simply does not lay proper emphasis on these things no, uh, i mean a lot of yeah i'm not surprised so that, at that's... all i'm not surprised <laughs> <laughs> this is what i expect it's the same in the us you know they the legal education as is stuck 200 years ago <laughs> is, so these are no one is anyway sorry go ahead so tell me more no, so so this is this is something where we we are developing pedagogy. I I'm not I'm not claiming uh, any perfected approach here, uh, but I think uh, we start with just exposing them to people from very different walks of life, uh, rather than you know keep it confined to the world of the law because I mean there are different ways of thinking that you get interacting with a sports person with a uh, you know content creator all kinds of you know. Uh, different people, right, who bring that uh, different approach to problem solving, uh, which then makes you self-aware that what you do have with you is indeed a valuable set of tools, but they are not the only set of tools, yeah. right? And I think that that's very important. Uh, and then from there, uh, my, I think for me personally, a lot of my business education at Stanford has helped because I did a negotiations course in the law school and then I've done in the business school and I can see the difference. Yes. How business schools approach it is, is vastly different. And yes. uh, I think in, in some ways uh, a whiff of uh, fresh air uh, because you you learn, uh, you learn to uh, think about options from multiple different perspectives rather than uh, just the legal perspective, right? So so I think we, we will probably begin from there, focus a lot on training people to arrive at a settlement and yeah. ways in which you define your boundaries yeah. Yeah. Uh, within which you play. Yeah. Right? And, and I think that, that that's very valuable education for anyone in today's uh, day and age. Okay. All right. Let me give you a thought. Okay. You know, I work as, I work as an expert witness in the U.S. I was... Not all the time, but many times. You know, I was an expert witness for the first time in 1985. So I have quite a bit of experience. So I've worked with lawyers and I see it's in utility regulation and such things like that, not in criminal cases. But the work I'm doing now involves uh, people who are expert witness. I, I will be the economic expert witness in civil litigation. Okay. But mostly the cases settled. But what I'm trying, what I, my thought is that in a, not con course, but in a seminar aimed only at a few people, uh, that you would have a system of connecting the dots that have not yet been connected. Because mm. Chad GPT is not a thinker. Right? Is, is, is not artificial intelligence at all. I've talked to people who are, know these things. They say it's a good summarizer. It's not an art. There's no intelligence there. It's just taking the knowledge that is known and is very good 
at balancing it and summarizing. It's a great summarizer. Absolutely. There's no intelligence Absolutely. there at all. You know, it's nothing. It's a, if it's not there in the literature, it cannot tell you that. It can only tell you what is the mainstream thinking, right? And it may yes. be able yes. to identify a few outliers also, right? Yes. But that's existing. But in many cases in law, you have to have an innovation. And certainly not every student will be in like that, but the leading people will be able to take uh, a particular case and apply a mix of theories, legal theories, I mean, and then say, look, this has not been applied here in the past. But yep. what I'm saying is that it applies in this way. It is not usual to take this precedent that is established, but it's not been brought in here. But in this particular case, it is meaningful. So this is sort of, you could call it out of the box thinking, which should become routine because now the data is there, right? You don't have to look, the data is there. And you, yes. But where is it coming from? That creativity in legal thinking, I think, will be useful for few of the students who are sort of leading students in your curriculum who can take a seminar and how you would train them i don't know but this is my thought i mean i gave you my own example in a recent case uh we had a in this personal injury litigation okay mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so this uh, young woman is hurt a uh, young woman means 28 she's hurt okay and so there is a medical claim right for her expenses mm -hmm. okay fine but the lawyer says that there is no claim for income loss because right. she has managed to hold a job that is uh, giving her almost the same income as before right as before. okay so there's no income loss right and i said guys there's something wrong here you're saying this woman is hurt and she needs all this medical care but she's able to earn the same money as before this doesn't make any sense to me but they said what can we do she's making the same money so then I introduced a new idea, I, which was, for me, it was very helpful to have the medical report, which said mm. that, you know, in the future, 20, 30 years, 15, 20, 30 years from now, she will mm. need support at home. Right now, she doesn't need support, but she will need because the pain and whatever, you know. But the key word there was she will need support at home. Okay. So that's my key word. I said to the lawyer that, listen, she's working extra hard now to earn the same amount of money. Mm, right. Okay. She's And can you get me an affidavit which says that? Mm. He said, no, I can't get you an affidavit, but I can get her to amend one of her previous answers, <laughs> which uh, is not a right. fresh affidavit, but you know, it's a continuing interrogatory. So in that, she can amend it because you're supposed to be able to amend it. So she will write in it that I'm working very hard, much harder to earn the same amount of money. And I said, look, her ability, her capacity will depreciate over time. And that it will depreciate because it's written there. Then he said, so what, how will you quantify it? I said, well, I'll go to finance and take straight line depreciation. <laughs> so, wow, yeah. that's very interesting. So he said, yeah. no, but suppose how, I said, listen, you know, they can argue with me whether it's straight line or non straight line depreciation, or they can even argue with me whether it's depreciation. But at least you have a starting point for a claim on income loss. And now you can settle it with that additional claim. You are penalizing this woman because she is not a loser, she's working extra hard to make the same money, right? So for that, you are saying, no, 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 you should have sat at home and pretended that you are only watching TV, then we'll give you the money. Now you are saying, no, you are working hard and making money you can't get. So then he accepted my logic, right? And he said, no, but what is all this depreciation? Jury won't understand. I said, fine. What I will do is I'll create another scenario. One in which she won't get promotions. Mm -hmm. She's making the same money now, but she's not getting any promotion. Yes because she cannot work super hard anymore. She's already beyond capacity. So she will hold her current wage at adjusted for inflation, but no productivity gain. 
So I gave him two scenarios, which are not legal, but it's running around a legal argument. So uh, connecting the dots between the finance world of depreciation and no promotion and the tort. This is tort, right? So it's a tort case of, okay, how do you deal with injury which doesn't seem to lead to uh, loss of income? So mm. I thought that was a way of, chat GPT cannot give me that. Right. Nobody can give me that. That's my own creative thinking. And uh, that's what I think the lawyers should also know how to do. Okay, That this is another legal theory. This is another point. And how can I make these come together? And that could be an important... It can't be a course. I think it has to be a seminar in which some people think that, listen, you have to do some out of the box thinking. You have to connect dots that chat GPT cannot connect or AI, which is just a summarizer, you know. And if people haven't written that before, then it cannot write it. Very true. Right? Thanks to both for bringing up this point uh, yeah. because uh, uh, a lot of people say, right, there is nothing really original except the combination of different things that you can bring to the table, yeah. right? Like whether it's engineering or law, that principle or that truth is is sort of fundamental. Uh, I mean, let's just look around at what people have done, whether it's the iPhone or whether it's uh, drone technology. I mean, it's all finally a combination of different things. And these are all people who have connected these dots very well. Uber exactly, is a very good exactly. example of This that, is right? exactly right. Especially in a legal case, you cannot bring in untested elements, okay? You, if I said, okay, I also have a new theory of depreciation, the court will throw me out. Yeah. But if I say this is a standard theory of depreciation, which I have brought in, at least on the point that it is a standard theory, the court will say, okay, now the question is, is it applicable here? So yes, absolutely. It's not just this. I am involved. I talk to people in startups and this and that. And what it really is, is 90%, 95% bringing things together and 5% spark, right? 5% yeah, yeah. is spark. The rest of it, it has to be tested through things that come together. Exactly. Things, exactly. Right? exactly. I, I mean, you know, there are geniuses who come up once in a while with something truly different, but the rest of us aren't like that. The rest of us can only take existing knowledge and connect the dots in a way that has not been yet connected. I think so that's, that's a absolutely. seminar which I think, you know, that would apply equally in economics. I never, you know, I don't teach anymore, so I'm not going to teach. Mm. But this mm. is what I think is uh, one of my thoughts uh, since you are open to thinking <laughs> crazy ideas. No, absolutely. Uh, no, we, we really have to curate something like this. And I, I personally think a collaborative setting, right, where students are, pushed to generate more questions yes just that just that one activity is a great starting point i'm not saying that's uh, the the full workshop but it can be a great starting point to push people to learn to bring these elements from various you know uh, areas that they've learned right and and then ask more questions and then you find answers you generate the answers as you go along but that critical inquiry uh, that makes you ask those questions is what helped you as an expert witness formulate something which the lawyer who's an expert may have missed, right? I mean, who's a legal expert may have missed. And, and is, is exactly the kind of thinking that I think a lot of law students can be trained uh, to do. Yeah. Uh, so a seminar or a workshop is, I think, the best format to make them uh, do more of this uh, critical uh, thinking. Uh, and then and just as a connected point, one of the things that we are also uh, toying with an idea is to get them into more of public policy uh, thinking, uh, because I find that unlike very narrow confines of legal thinking, public policy enables you to draw these linkages from, let's say, climate sciences, uh, economics, behavioral uh, you know, aspects of, of uh, you know, various disciplines. And of course, law and policy, right? And and that enables you to learn to ask sophisticated questions as you go along, which draw insights from these multiple disciplines. 
And that ability to draw these linkages is what I think AI is not able to do, right? So that's no, a because clear AI, differentiator. Yeah, AI is only summarizer. And so summarizer cannot connect new dots. Yeah. It cannot connect new yeah. dots or cannot connect loosely connected dots. It's going to have to go to the median, to the mainstream, uh, and not to the outliers, right? So that is... Yeah. By definition, I think the weakness, unless you tell it, I don't want the mainstream, I want weird thoughts, <laughs> maybe <laughs> then you can get only outlier theory, only dissents I want. Right? You know, I don't want the main judgments, I want only dissents, or I want only a dissent, not a formal dissent, but only a footnote dissent. Then you might right. get something, right? But anyway, I'm just talking without being a lawyer. So let me let stop, let me have you talk. Right. So we 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 did uh, you know sort of dis distill these two very important aspects in this uh, conversation. The the first is the emphasis on certain kinds of soft skills and that collaborative uh, you know ability, and the second is the critical thinking part. And the third major paradigm shift that I see happening is that is more substantive is the uh, is the concern relating to ethics, concern relating to misinformation. Uh, privacy and so on, which in turn is fueling a lot of action on the law and policy front. Uh, so we are in a very strange uh, uh, situation right now where uh, we saw some of the big tech companies uh, getting rid of uh, their responsible computing teams and so on. But but having said that, I think law and policy is not going anywhere, uh, right? I mean, it, it, it is going to continue to be an important stakeholder because uh, we also have parallel strong conversations uh, where people are uh, questioning how far can we go with all of this, right? AI and uh, automation. And, and that automatically will uh, result in uh, focus around areas like data protection, right? Uh, technology, ethics, and law. That is, a, that is, I think, going to be a huge emerging area of uh, focus. Uh, competition law, because a lot of your big tech guys hold all this data and they can sort of incubate more innovation and stop others from innovating. So that is a big concern. And then we've seen that uh, in uh, in the US, in Europe and in India. Uh, so I think these areas uh, are, are the substantive areas where you're going to see a lot of new jobs uh, being created. So legal education also then needs to undergo a paradigm shift uh, to yeah. make uh, lawyers aware of these new and emerging areas. Some of it is going to be interdisciplinary. For instance, data protection is a classic example. Uh, the way lawyers think about other areas of enforcement and regulation, that may not fly when it comes to data because you also need some degree, I'm not saying a sophisticated understanding, but some degree of understanding of data science, right? What is really going on behind the scenes? What is uh, it that statisticians and data scientists are really doing? What are these models all about? And what are black box algorithms? So that degree of comfort with uh, scientific and technological vocabulary is required for you to be an effective uh, service provider in these areas. Yes, right? So course. legal education paradigms will, will change yeah, to yeah, accommodate. Yeah. Uh, accommodate. Uh, well, that's great. I, I'm happy to hear it. I have no comments. I'm just happy to hear it. I think though, uh, the only comment I would say is that there needs to be some more, perhaps, training or thinking about competition. Okay. We do have the Competition Commission in India. I don't know how effective it is. I honestly don't know. I'm not being critical. I haven't yeah, really yeah. looked at it. But I know that there's a lot of turmoil in the U.S. with the FTC coming out with new legal theories and getting shot down in every case. Right? So, yes. They file cases against companies and the judges say, no, this is a too, too novel or too unsubstantiated or whatever, but they don't win. Okay. But maybe they will win in the future. So the theories of uh, competition are in the legal field are changing. Whether they are actually yeah. going to change, we don't know. But certainly, the Federal Trade, the FTC in US, uh, now run by a young woman, 
is yes. looking to change competition law. Yes. And yes. I think the competition law may not really be the best. The old competition law may not really suit uh, the emerging Indian economic Absolutely. situation. I, I, I honestly say I don't know. But that's mm -hmm. an area in which economics is perhaps also lagging behind. And yeah. I think the law may also be lagging behind, but that's just an unsubstantiated opinion. I cannot say that I have done thinking or analysis, but on the surface, it looks like that this needs, uh, if India is growing, is going to grow fast and equitably, then these issues need to be looked at. You know, where okay. is the competition, what is fair competition, what is not fair competition, how to do it, I have no suggestions. But certainly something which I hope that there is a course, something like that, which looks at competition, law internationally and in India, and how we could do a better job uh, and that's a very subjective view that we could do a better job. It may turn out that we are already doing a good job. I don't know the answer, but just a thought. Yeah. No, new policy frameworks uh, are uh, in some ways the need of the hour because uh, uh, that and that I think is what we uh, sort of learned from the FTC experience that Lina Khan started yes. uh, this uh, this movement through her you know uh, law review article initially yes. the Amazon. Yes. And that was paradox, and uh, subsequently, as part of the FTC, and now the chairperson. But uh, uh, like you point out, I think some problems require a multidisciplinary approach and changes within or, or across disciplines to provide the supporting uh, frameworks. Uh, or, or another way that uh, I mean, the European Union is infamous. <laughs> let me say for this is is the is the approach where you say, look, the frameworks are what they are, but <laughs> we we uh, we have a certain uh, view on the matter. We have a certain distrust, perhaps, for big tech, and we will now approach everything from that lens. And you you can see that conflict uh, play out very differently in the European Union as compared with uh, the United States. And uh, I think I think as a legal educator, what what uh, we we sort of try to do here is to make them aware that these transitions are happening and as and when the laws change you should be in a position to uh, take full advantage of that and provide the best service to your uh, clients and therefore learn the old but be aware that something new is potentially coming away you know okay be it right. liability principles in tort law or digital comp competition in the digital economy it is, it is pretty much the same approach because uh, you know AI, for instance, liability is a huge issue, and currently we are still struggling with it. Like, how do you pin liability? What are the principles? How do you adapt the earlier principles to the new situations? Yeah, and uh, you know, it, it is it's not an easy answer for sure. Yeah, so these uh, are so, things that you know you cannot get from software even today. Yeah, yeah. software is just a summarizer of past knowledge. That's yeah. So, exactly. okay, wonderful. Let me not stop you. If you have something more to say, let's hear it. Yeah, so so I would I would uh, you know as a as a sort of concluding thought, I, I would I would only really say that uh, we have for so many years relied on this system of precedent. Yeah. So there was that wise person, uh, usually yeah. a man, yeah. <laughs> usually a white man, yeah. <laughs> who spoke, right? Yeah. And I learned, you know, largely uh, many, many subjects, uh, tort law, competition law, company yeah. law, from the perspective of that white male uh, judge who laid yeah. down something very significant. And my professors, uh, you know, taught us that you need to remember the ratio and so on. And suddenly, like a decade later or 15 years down the line, many of these paradigms have just completely collapsed. Because if you want to remember it, like you said, all you need to do is, you know, Google it and that's right there at your fingertips. Uh, if you want to analyze it, 
well, uh, at, a, at a very base level of analysis today, the AI is definitely there yeah. uh, and doing that, yeah. right? So what do you then do? And I think, you know, uh, as, as educators, we all have the responsibility to think uh, more deeply into that. Uh, I think the one thing that is certain is that there is a paradigm shift uh, for sure, because the skills that were valued at the time when I graduated are no longer the skills that will hold you in good stead uh, to to develop a successful uh, practice or to make headway as a policy maker and so on. Uh, so we we are constantly sort of reflecting on these questions as to what these new challenges are, and then adapt our legal education model to suit that. And uh, all that I shared in the last you know uh, forty minutes or so of our conversation has just been very preliminary thoughts. Uh, speaking yeah. to you has really helped me in some ways gain a little more clarity and, yeah. and I'm sure uh, you know that, that these kinds of conversations are required uh, with multiple stakeholders for us to get to a point where the Bar Council of India and other regulatory bodies uh, see reason and they too take an active interest in reforming the curriculum. That's an important element too at the end of the day. Uh, okay. So so I will I will end on that. <laughs> okay, yeah. I think we will catch up one year from now to see where you Absolutely. are and whether yes. Chat GPT yes. has wiped you out <laughs> or <laughs> or you have learned how to make it your tool. Absolutely. One of Absolutely. the two. You know, learn yes. okay, fine. Chat GPT, yeah, that's in my running in the background. Here I yes. am. So let's see where you are one year from now and catch Absolutely. up with you. And till then, it has been a great experience for me to hear all these things. I'm not a lawyer, obviously, but I understand what you are saying. And I think what you are saying appeals to me. All right. And that's all I can say. Thank you so much. Let's say bye. So much. Yeah, let's say bye to the viewers. So bye-bye. I'll be back with another expert or some young person next time. Bye-bye.